big thank you to David, um, who you can see there, and he's to the left of me, to the right of me. Um, we're delighted to have you, especially as you're about to jump on a plane as well. So I'm really grateful that you're able to spend just a few minutes talking to us today. Um, David has had a bit of a roller coaster of a year since um, winning the funding competition and then the Entrepreneur of the Year. And then as that wasn't enough, he also went in for the Santander um, competition that um, culminated last week in the final that he was a part of and did an absolutely phenomenal job standing in front of, um, I think it was about 80 other universities, wasn't it? It was an absolute, um, yeah, such an achievement for, for David. Um, he's here today to talk to us um, a little bit about the, um, the process and through which he went through the competitions to offer some top tips, what he thinks people are interested in, how to kind of create a deck that, um, hi Katarin, well done. Hope you others take the lead. <laughs> Yay, well done. Two points. You're through to the final round already of the competition. <laughs> um, and yeah, but the, the main thing here is that you guys get to answer, ask the questions that, um, that you have. Um, so please either pop them in the chat if it's too early to, to speak um, or put up the weird little jaundice looking hand um, and um, we'll just shout out. It's a free for all. Um, so I, what I'd love David um, to do, if OK, David, is just to um, pitch, pitch yourself, do a quick elevator pitch um he is he's well versed in pitching on zoom I know that last week it was the first time he'd actually pitched in human flesh form um so you should be a <laughs> this should be a, a walk in the park for you David but we'd love to hear what you're working on um, and then we'll go into some more details on the competition etc sure hey everybody um good to be with you LJ thank you for the invitation um I never feel qualified to do these things, but we've gone through a few of these rounds now and so happy to at least have a conversation about uh, the trials and tribulations around, you know, pitching, you know, starting a business, those kinds of things. So just uh, an honor to be among you guys that are uh, fellow entrepreneurs and, and trying to do great things. So um, I founded a company called M. Cultivo and it was actually out of an LSE master's program and that was the connection uh, here. Um, and so what we, do is we provide accessible technology to the next generation of coffee farmers and we're expanding beyond coffee but our focus is in coffee so we help them do things like relationship management inventory management communication and then we roll it all up into dashboard insights uh, so essentially bringing them the technology the tools and the information they need to compete uh, globally because um, they are in global competition with all kinds of companies and they need all that to uh to move the products to market and do that efficiently and at a price that they can run their farms at uh, profitably. Fantastic. Um, that's brilliant. And if you want to have a little look at David's um, website, it's it's just up there in the chat. Um, so, David, you went in for the, I think it was the Michaelmas term funding competition, wasn't it? Um, or was it the Lent in the end? Doesn't really matter. They're both exactly the same. Um, but can you just give us some um, some kind of top tips on um, on what you'd recommend when you're actually just going through that first round, which essentially now is just a, a pitch deck um, and a and a film, a sixty second. Um, film. Maybe just talk about some of the and maybe some of the feedback that you got from the judges. Um, and also, if helpful, incorporate some of the feedback that you got from the Santander um, mentors as well, because it all feeds into the same um, the same kind of process of actually getting a, a really clean pitch tech pitch deck ready. Sure. Yeah. So I think um, the one thing I would mention just right out of the gate is that um, you know you guys all want to do well in pitch competitions. We we did as well. Um, working on the business is a part of doing well in the pitch competition. So um, as the, although this can be a very draining um, and exhaustive exercise to kind of extract your narrative uh, around your business and get people excited about it, um, and, and although it is very worthwhile, I think uh, that, that might be my top tip is working on the business actually gives you a stronger pitch. So doing things like customer interviews, customer conversations, trying to demonstrate traction early on in your business model. Um, those are all very, very important things. If you can get to some kind of revenue, that is a really powerful uh, statement in a pitch, probably more so than, than any story you could tell, um, just the fact that you've generated revenue. Um, and so for the, for, the, for the video and the initial um, entry, you don't have a lot of time, right? Um, and so there's, there's only a few ways to, to kind of hack this up. I think a lot of people take the approach, and I think it is a good approach, is sort of this uh, hero's journey where 
you sort of build suspense um, around the problem. And then people want, you know, we naturally as human beings, we want to solve a problem. And so when you build suspense around the problem, and then you come in with a solution, it feels like a really tight, well, well worked pitch. Um, and so I might do that in the one one minute video is just try and, you know, set up the problem, set up the solution, don't get into too many numbers and details, because um, people will just kind of lose you there. So keep a more narrative approach. Um, there are several ways to do this. So, so this isn't, you know, by the book, I'm just giving general advice. And then for the actual deck, um, the the initial entry of the deck, obviously, since it needs to be standalone, needs to have more words. Um, so you you have to kind of go through this act one, act two, act three sort of situation with your deck generally, which is have an intro, have a problem, have the solution. What's the business model would be act two. You know, what is the product um, and then what traction have you established? And then in act three, um, that that's likely going to be focused on the opportunity market strategy, the size, the team and kind of conclude that way. Don't use the same deck in the first stage as you do in the second stage. Um, it, it's, it's likely gonna have too much going on for people to track in, a, in more of a presentation format. Um, so that's what I would say. That's brilliant, yeah, and really, really good point. So if you do get to the final, um, you're invited to come and speak for 10 minutes and then 10 minutes Q and A, um, and then the judges have a little power and decide um, on marks. But the, um, yeah, the, the first round, I would say kind of max 20 slides um, for that. Um, there is, there's a difference um, now, and I think it was the same with when David was there, there between ideas and launched. Um, if you're wavering between the kind of ideation stage and, oh, well, I've kind of launched, I've got my website up, I would probably just a strategic kind of idea, a bit of tactical um, advice. I would veer towards the idea stage because if you go for the launch stage, you're up against people who are already generating a ton of revenue and been in the game for kind of two to three years. So just to maximize your chance of getting into that final. Um, I've just also put a link in the chat for some new validation um, workshops that we're offering um, with the most amazing of um, teachers, Lisa Makarova. She's gonna be running our next accelerator as well. Um, I would definitely come along to them. So out the, the feedback that generally comes out of the application stage is that people haven't done enough market testing and um, so to ensure that you've got that really robust kind of validation piece sorted I definitely recommend um, you pop along to to these. Have we got any questions so far from what um, anything that David has mentioned or anything that I've said? It can be absolutely any questions there are no wrong questions only the ones you don't ask. <laughs> yes Leah. Hi, you both. Thanks so much for um, yeah that overview. Really, really interesting. Um, just when you mentioned the idea stage um, entry, like how far does your idea actually need to be? Like how much work would you need to have done? David, you mentioned like the team. Um, yeah, can, can that be kind of work in progress and the idea is good or yeah? So I'll, I'll kind of speak about this from the kind of generate the criteria side. And then David, if you want to add anything just from a kind of business point of view. Um, Leah, I think um, well, if you're going in for the ideation, it needs to be just slightly further along than just you've sat in a pub, had a great idea, spoken to your mates and they're like, you should do it. It's a great idea. So that's great. You've got the passion. You've got the idea. It's likely to have legs. But have you have you spoken? Have you surveyed? Have you market tested? Um, so we need to see that that kind of um, groundwork has been done. That research has been done. You know that there's a market for it. And um, you've spoken to your audience. Maybe you've spoken to some potential um, stakeholders, some business partners. And um, you don't have to have you don't have to have a team. So quite often when the um, when the money ask comes in, um, it will be to hire a CTO or it will be to hire an intern to manage all of the, the kind of admin crap so you can actually get on with doing the job in hand um but yeah it needs to be more than like i think this is going to change the world <laughs> because we all have that and um, but we want to see that you've put that groundwork in place okay maybe can i just follow up on that because you mentioned website uh there doesn't need to be a website in place or okay no i don't think so i mean i'd get your website up when you're ready to to kind of to yeah, to do the hardcore marketing. What do you think, David, around websites and social media and all of that? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely you need to, it, it's, a, it's a balance, right? So you want to be conscious that 
you know, people will go to your website and read your website. And so your, your messaging has to be tuned to an audience. Um, if you are just in pure ideation stage, um, you might not know who your audience is and who your customer is. And so it's fairly difficult to craft a message to people that you don't know who they are or what their customer archetype or, or is. So if, I, if, if you are in kind of a pure idea stage, I'd agree. I think the first step is, um, you know, we went through this customer journey mapping, which I felt was a helpful tool. Um, so you can definitely look that up um, and just have 50 interviews or 25 interviews with who you think your potential customer is and, and, and walk through. OK, so I don't even propose your solution. Just, you know, so you get to this point in your day and this happens. And what was that like? How did that make you feel? Um, you know, just ask, you know, what I call very you know, courageously dumb questions <laughs> and, and have a bunch of uh, interviews that way. And I think you'll, I think you'll go a long way just by talking to 25, 50 people. You'd be surprised how many people don't do that. How many businesses just don't do that. And it's a shame because those are the people you're trying to serve. You need to love on them and serve them well. And, and, and your solution needs to do that. So, so make sure it's doing that. Brilliant. Courageously dumb questions. That's going to be our strap line, I think, for the validation boot camps. Amazing. <laughs> Lee, I hope that's answered your question. Feel free to come back in a bit as well. Um, Sia, I think I, I can't see you, but I can see at you. Hello. Hi there. A couple of numbers were actually mentioned just now, but just following up on the market validation research idea. I mean, validation could be done to different degrees of robustness. What would be a acceptable level of validation. David, do you first and I'll come in? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still in market validation and we always will be. Um, so it certainly can be done at different levels of robustness. We've been working on Cultivo now for about a year and a half um, as a team. And, uh, and our goal is to continue market validation, which allows us to iterate and improve on our product. I think from a pitch standpoint, um, any sort of uh, any, any sort of numbers and, 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 and conversations you have are, are fantastic. I think that LSE is, is unique because you do have more of an academic slant to um, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the, the judges in the panel. There's ties, obviously, to the university. Other places, you do not have that. You have more angel investors that are just kind of wheeling and dealing in the marketplace, and they, they think differently. And so I think it, at, at LSE, it does help to have some more rigor to your validation from, call it an academic standpoint. I mean, what, uh, what has have there been any white papers on it, studies on it? Are there any statistics that exist that, that would be helpful? And I think your, your audience will actually be more patient and willing to listen to those. Whereas if you were just pitching to a guy on the tube, he probably would fall asleep immediately if you started talking about those things. But um, I, I would say those two points is definitely get your feet on the street in the marketplace, have conversations with real people and get some of that more qualitative subjective validation around the idea um, and make sure that you understand your vertical. And then after, you know, as a, as a secondary or in parallel, certainly have some uh, a little bit more academic rig, rig around it. Well, because you have resources to all these studies and white papers that other people don't have access to. So get that in there too. Yeah, absolutely. What he said, I, I mean, it's very much an iterative process. So if you say that you've done all your validation, that you'd probably be straight out the competition because it's just a lack of a kind of awareness. I think as well, just kind of going beyond your immediate kind of inner circle of your family and your friends and going out, showing that you've been really proactive um, with, with that validation. I think that, like as David mentioned, that kind of nice holistic combo of quant and qualitative. Um, if, you've done, if it's based on your dissertation, it's an easy win because you can bring in all of those um, stats. But yeah, I think you need the numbers and um, you've, you've gone out your target audience you've done really thorough research as David said those kind of white papers and things we have I would say we have probably 50% academic 50% business practitioners um, and so it's a really really good combo but yeah it's I think we can see quite quickly and um, how much time you spent on the ideation um, phase so just make sure those yeah those numbers are, are robust I would also say that things like um, like Instagram platforms are good for just kind of gauging 
um, kind of audience um, interest as well. So you've got to be careful because you want to, when you launch, you want to properly launch and you want to be impressive. But just if you are, if you are getting a bit of an audience through social media, um, just really kind of note who is it that's signing up, who is the, who is it that's commenting. You can DM, slide into their DMs as the kids on the block say, um, but just kind of interact with new, new audience members so we can see that you've gone that extra mile and you've gone outside of your comfort zone and then you've recorded that. And also kind of what have you done with those, with that data? as well so not just collected it and popped it on a slide but where is that now taking you I think that's really really important um Louise can we assume a certain level of awareness from the judges I mean I'm aware of something and for a mental health or climate change project um yeah I think if it's a very nuanced um kind of area within mental health um or climate change then definitely um, kind of give us the give us the lowdown um, on that. I mean, m- most people know why climate change um, is is an issue. Um, so assume that they are vaguely intelligent. Um, but if it's if it's quite and um, yeah, that so if it's quite nuanced or if it's going to be stuff that you just wouldn't know unless you were a specialist or you've done a dissertation or a PhD, bring in all the data. I mean, I think the more the merrier, as long as it's not too crowded on your pitch deck. Um, I think, yeah, I think that would be helpful. What I would also say is that when we look at the finalists um, to go through to the um, the Dragon's Den, we'll make sure that we do have specialists that can speak to those to those subjects, especially if they're super kind of nerdy specific. Um, we'll we'll bring someone on, but yeah, you can assume that these guys have been in the game. They've probably reviewed, t- especially wellbeing and climate change, because they're two of the most popular um, sectors for LSE students. Um, so I think you're you're okay there, David. What would you what would you say? It'd be I I I, I agree with what you said, LJ, and I would put one maybe note of caution, which is um, because the pitch is so short. I mean, even if it's ten minutes, it's relatively short. Uh, you 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 often get entrepreneurs that will uh, rely on buzz term like buzzwords or buzz terms. Um, and climate change and mental health quickly veer into that territory, not because they are themselves, but because they are so prevalent in the news cycle that um, that you, you don't want to. Yeah, I would say you don't want to use kind of more mental heuristics or shortcuts to cheat your pitch. So um, one thing that might be a helpful exercise if you're concerned about that area is um, explaining it to, you know, try and explain it to a five year old. Um, and, and then, uh, after you've kind of gone through that process of explaining to the five year old, maybe, maybe that becomes the most brilliant pitch in the world and you use that, but that's never happened for me. It's just helped to get it a uh, very clear, concise language that I can then take that language and then I can put it into a more robust, potentially sophisticated pitch that I'm talking to somebody else about. But I wouldn't assume that, um, I would assume that people are reasonably intelligent, but I wouldn't assume that they're experts on climate change or experts on mental health. I think that's a pretty broad leap. And even the people that are experts on mental health, there's so many niches in that, so much minutia within it. I think that it'd be really hard to cover that. So just make sure that you spend time on the problem and make sure that it's hyper clear what that problem is. Um, don't just rely on saying, you know, climate change is a disaster problem, as we know, move on to the solution. I think it needs to be a little bit more than that. Yeah. And the film can add, uh, can kind of complement that pitch deck as well, if you want to bring it to life um, in some way as well. So do bear that, bear that in mind as well. And um, Catherine, I can see you've been waiting patiently in the wing. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Everything has been uh, building a bit into the, into the answer as well. Um, I have a question and it's like, I'm already working on my business, but we are kind of like developing a raw material somehow, and we are not developing a product itself, a use case for this raw material itself. So it is a bit difficult because I, I'm just going to say it because it's just easier is a, a biodegradable plastic made of cassava starch in Colombia. Uh, but we are not starting with the idea, oh, we want to make this fork biodegradable and for this fork, I can analyze the market in Colombia, in Germany, in UK, et cetera. That would be fairly easy. But we are trying to keep it open also for the sake of the business to develop the material. And we know that we're going to have market barriers. We know that we're going to have uh, probably in the moment of the developing the product, also some mechanical and chemical barriers that are going to like lead us to the path of what we want to, to create and put in the market. So 
it's a bit difficult for me to like when we talk about validation or estimation of the market size because we are trying to keep it open we are already working on it we have a team a really good team that knows that this is feasible because they have worked on this in the in the past but i'm not sure about like how can i go about this uh, validation if i still don't have like a cost i still don't have a specific niche or market like we're in the process of, of getting there so I don't know if you have any advice for this case. David, do you want to jump in first? If there's any parallels with what you yeah. did and Cultiva as well. I, I think um, I would ask two questions. Um, just, it's just in your internal dialogue as you prepare. Um, what would excite people to hear in your pitch? Um, and then why would they hesitate? Um, and so as I'm hearing you talk, what excites me about that is uh, that you're attacking a developing world market potentially that is it's it's got you know millions and maybe even billions of of consumers. I mean, people are going to start using forks. I would imagine in emerging markets, you know, are people shifting off chopsticks and into forks or something like that? There's probably something in that to say, okay, there's this larger macro trend going on here. Um, and then obviously you have a very tightly woven impact story in that if there's a certain amount of waste that's plastic forks or, you know, or metal building metal forks is, you know, a, 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 a very painful thing for the environment for some reason or other. I think there's probably something there. Why I would hesitate um, would be uh, what is the R&D cycle? What is the cost? Um, who, who does this now? Who are your competitors? Are there any competitors? Um, you know, are, who, who's your customer? Are you selling to, is this a B2B type business or is this a B2C type business? And then those have different questions and cycles. Um, is this patentable? Um, I think that that gets asked sometimes and that's a really hard question to answer as a startup. Um, <laughs> and, and so you might be able to do some, some preliminary research. And, and I think judges, judges know that there are some, some ideas that, that are take heavier R&D and they, they won't beat you up just because you didn't have a quick, you know, Go to market strategy it's some things just do take two to three years to launch but they're worthy of launching and so lean into that and just be realistic and honest about it don't don't try and uh you know don't 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 jump into con man mode and try and get people to think that this is going to be great and it's going to launch in a month i mean it just doesn't work be honest yeah that's what i would say awesome thank you yeah, and I would just, I think exactly as David has said, I think if you can speak to as many people like David or mentors or just friends and family or your five-year-old nephew um, and just see what questions are coming up so that you can kind of move in and in your deck, you can approach them before they come up in, in the screening or in the finals as well. The more questions that you get, and you'll see patterns as well, and um, the more people um, you speak to. Um, I, yeah, I would also say just one thing that came up when you were speaking is if it does take kind of two to three years, which is entirely possible, and um, just talk a little potentially about your financial runway, how you're going to sustain yourself, um, just so they can see realistically whether you're going to be able to um, kind of stay in the game for, for that long and look into grants, look into like generate founderships, those kind of things as well. Just make sure that that often comes up, especially when people have just graduated and they're in a ton of horrendous debts and, and paying a bazillion pounds a minute for rent in London. London. Um, David, um, would you have any specific tips for a firm in B2B? Uh, yeah, so I, I always felt we are a B2B solution and we are a very um, specific niche in vertical and coffee. And, and I always felt that our story might be a little bit harder to tell, but if you can tell it appropriately, um, I think it's a really compelling opportunity. Um, I think B2B businesses are, yeah, I, I just think uh, there's a lot of energy and time spent on B2C and, and, and B2B businesses. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity for growth um, and disruption in those types of industries. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be nervous about your pitch from that regard. I think that you, you might have one of the better opportunities uh, being presented. I think the difficult thing is, is people can naturally relate to a B2C type business because they can imagine themselves in customer shoes. And unfortunately, uh, judges, panels, people listening to your pitch, audience members, whoever it may be, um, they, tend to, uh, they tend to empathize uh, better with customers and that makes them like those pitches better almost. So one, one tact that I've used in the past is, um, you know, being more analogous. Um, even though it's a B2B business. So something like, 
imagine you were in this position. So for us, it was, you know, coffee farmers and coffee producing facilities. So um, imagine that you are a, a coffee producing organization and you only get paid one time a year. Imagine you are an employee at a bank and your salary doesn't come in every two weeks. It comes in once a year. Well, that's the situation that coffee farmers are in all over the world. And so you can kind of build on this kind of narrative in that way and, and, and take a more empathetic approach by, you know, making an analogous situation to something that they probably are very familiar with, like getting a salary every two weeks. I mean, everybody's generally familiar with that. So um, that's what I would say is, is, is bring it home somehow and, and be conscious of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, use your LSE network as well. So um, courses such as the Trium, which is the exec MBA, they have a whole load of entrepreneurs working in big corporates. If you can speak to them, get their ideas. But I think as well, that storytelling um, component um, is so useful. And I think one thing that I always remember and um, that comes back is when in the discussions, um, either the Dragon's Den or the final um, shortlisting, the judges will often say, oh, that story about that person that did that. Oh, that person that went through that. It's the it's the really human story storytelling piece that I think kind of gets you over the line quite often. And as David said, it's much more difficult when it's a B two B. But you can personalize those those businesses as well. And so a X within that business has said this. Um, and so yeah, it, it bring it to life as much as possible. They they go through hundreds of these applications, and their eyes eyes do quite often glaze over with the B two B. So you've got to maximize your chances of keeping them awake. Um, Thank you. It's also, yeah, it, it depends on the vertical too, but I've also seen people use brands effectively, you know, like, oh, we're a B2B to solution in clothing and we've had conversations or signed up Patagonia and North Face and, you know, pe things that people recognize, like you can kind of a little bit cheat there by just saying, oh, these are giant brands that we've talked to and they're amazing and they think we're amazing. I mean, that really helps. Definitely. And if they are a little bit clueless about what you're trying to explain, the fact that you've spoken to Patagonia or Oxfam or Topshop before it went under, like it, just having that gives them the benefit of the doubt if they're still slightly unsure as to whether this thing has legs or not. And um, so, yeah, plonk those brands on your deck as much as possible, but be ready to defend it if they do dig a bit deeper. There was a situation recently where um, one of our entrepreneurs actually it was at Santander, they said, oh, I, I've been in contact with Lush, the soap, the really smelly soap shop. And when you delve a little bit deeper, she'd just been on a tour of their building. So there was no, there was nothing substantial to that. So just be ready. If you are going to put a big name um, on your deck, be ready to de defend it. And um, Sia, I know that we're just running out of time and I know that someone has a plane to catch and you've probably got something else to go to, but um, Sia and Yusuf. Uh, okay, I'll make this one quick. This is a question for David, um, two-part question. At what uh, stage was your business when you applied for funding at the LSE and how did you find your first customer? Yeah, we were, um, we were at certainly a, a little bit further on than ideation stage. You know, uh, you know, my master's at LSE was social business and entrepreneurship. So part of that master's was to create a, a, a business. We took that probably overly seriously, right? We ended up with a business. So um, the, the stage we were at, we had an MVP ready to launch. Um, and, and keep in mind that the LSC generate process was throughout a nine month period about, and, and businesses changed drastically throughout that. So when we first applied, we had an MVP ready for launch. We had pilot users lined up. We had people actually on our platform. I mean, we were, we were fairly we were fairly uh, far along in that, I'd say. Um, and, you know, my my it, my experience is uh, in coffee as vertical. I mean, I was on the founding team of a of a coffee importer in the U.S., so I knew the industry really well. We had a runway to, to even scale at that point, but we were kind of MVP pilot stage. And then by the time that we got to the um, Entrepreneur of the Year competition, nine months later, we had run the pilot through almost completely and we were convert actively converting pilot users to customers and trying to scale. And so we had hit revenue. Um, and then three months further was the Santander competition uh, that, that LJ mentioned. And at that point we were, you know, we are scaling, you know, we've, you know, hit a hundred thousand dollars in revenue and we've, you know, there's, there's, there's bones um, in place to, to, to move this forward. Um, so, but I, I think that, you know, the, the folks that I've seen win competitions um, are not necessarily people that have been in business five years, established revenue and those things. That's not, 
you know, sometimes it is just the best idea that wins. And, um, and I think char charisma in these moments um, plays a lot. Being likable plays a lot. Um, so I would, I would focus on those and I wouldn't worry about, you know, the other businesses that might have, you know, hit revenue 10 times over. Um, it, it just, it, it, it just, just play to your strengths. Yeah, the amount of meetings that have ended in, but I just really like them. I want to give them a go. And so, yeah, try and be try and be as likable as possible. <laughs> Maybe we need to do a session in that, <laughs> how to be a nice person. Um, can I just say, Yusuf, in terms of the financials, yeah, I mean, there's probably a difference between ideation and launch. Um, I would probably say that if, if you're in the ideation stage, it's more about kind of what you would use the money for. But we would like to, for you to think at least about the kind of first 18 months of um, a kind of cash flow, kind of projecting um, what you think. I mean, look at other businesses that are doing similar things, look at their patterns and, and kind of make a comparison. And um, I think if you're launched, then we'd look for a kind of a three year um, financial projection that needs to be quite quite robust um, and if you're doing the kind of further two years they can be a bit blurred and hazy and it just shows that you recognize that I mean it's difficult especially in the kind of post-covid world as well that would be one thing I would re um, recommend and David's probably not as um, it wouldn't have been as much part of it although he was going through it during the the plague and um, but I would just think about how you are covid proofing um, and also brexit proofing as well that's something that quite often comes up depending on the industry that you're working in so just the these kind of um kind of more timely or kind of yeah zeitgeist as well like just focus in on um on them where you need to any Thank you. Final, no problem any final questions i think we'll probably have one more um one more session and um, before the fight before the deadline which is on the 31st of October a Halloween deadline um but yeah feel free to come along to that and if you do have any questions we're running business clinics one-on-one -on -one business clinics I think from this week actually um with one of our coaches Tim Deason so you can ask him any questions he's he's great you can't directly ask generate um those questions just because we are sitting on the panel in the first round so a bit of conflict of interest there um but otherwise yeah ask I mean just the more people you speak to about this, the, the better. The question that often comes up is like, I, I want to kind of protect my idea and I don't want anyone to take it. Like it's bollocks, like just go out there and speak to as many people as you possibly can, especially in these early stages. Um, because the ones that win are generally the ones that have just hoard themselves across London or wherever they are and just asked and begged and spent time with people just getting under the skin of yeah, who, who they might be as an audience. Um, so best of luck. This recording will go, I'll get um, Pemi to edit it and it will go up on the web page. So if you do want to just kind of reflect and digest some of that, then, um, then that's absolutely fine. Good luck as well. Um, yeah, just go for it. I would say even if you're doubtful as to whether you will get into the final, just the process of going through this, quite often the comments that we get are that actually that it was a brilliant exercise, even though I didn't win the money, hopefully you will. And the mentoring, by the way, which is quite often more precious and kind of valuable than the actual um, moolah. But um, yeah, just the exercise of actually going through this, you will get feedback. Um, and then you can go in for as many future competitions as well. There's no limit. We quite often have people that have been through it five times and they suddenly win. Um, so yeah never give up all that cheesy insta talk um david thank you so much i love i love speaking to you because every time i speak to you you're on to the next stage and it's brilliant to see your journey and kind of travel on that with you gosh i'm getting cheesier by the second um, and <laughs> have have a brilliant trip back and um and we'll be in touch with you soon and everyone else thanks for tuning in and um and good luck and whether or not you go for this best of yeah best of luck with your with your journey and we'll see you super soon thank you Thank you.